Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar series. Uh, it's on introduction to using the variable infiltration capacity or WIC model uh, with NASA observations. So my name is Amita Mehta and I'm from NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. Um, I have my co-instructor here, uh, Mr. Cale Marker. He's from University of Alabama at Huntsville and he's also a part of uh, NASA Surveyor Global Program. So today um, we're going to first start with introduction of the entire webinar series and then Kale will talk more about Big Model itself. So the overall objective of this training is to teach about where and how to download WIC model, how to set it up for a particular watershed or river basin using remote sensing data, and finally how to analyze uh, output uh, for a number of applications including water resources uh, management and also for uh, flood or drought applications. So at the end of this training, uh, all the attendees will learn uh, where and how to download and install a WIC model on your own computer, where to go and get WIC inputs, and finally how to implement um, WIC for a river basin and then analyze output. So this is going to be the overall outline of the training. Um, as you know, there are three sessions uh, today. Um, second uh, is on 22nd February and third one 1st of March. Um, all three sessions are repeated twice a day, uh, 9 to 10 a.m. and 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern U.S. time. This is basically to cover different time zones here in the U.S. as well as internationally. So overall, we will have first session today. It's mostly introduction of the model itself. Uh, so it is introduction to the weak hydrological model. Uh, second one, which is next week at the same time, will be on overview of remote sensing based input data for WIC. We're we'll totally devoted to just data preparation for uh, WIC model. And finally, the third session will be how to implement the model and how to analyze the output for a specific river basin. And for this webinar series, we are going to use the Mekong River Basin. Uh, Mekong River is in Southeast Asia, and as you can see, here is the shapefile outlining the Mekong River Basin. So we will present a case study about uh, Mekong. We are going to focus on overall water resources management and show a flood and drought case both using WIC. So that is the overall outline. Now, uh, some important information. This is our RSET, or Applied Remote Sensing Training Programs website. Um, here is where you will find all the information about um, this webinar. You will find all the presentation slides on this site, um, not only in English, we also have Spanish uh, translate, uh, slides translated in Spanish. They will also be here. Um, after each session, recordings will be placed at the same site, so you can access the webinar or you can listen to it recording later on as well. So this is the main uh, go-to site for all the course material. Also, uh, there will be a homework uh, that will be posted uh, uh, for session three. After session three, you will be able to see this homework on the same site, on our set site for a week webinar. And uh, of answer of this homework, you will have a Google form link. You will go to that link and answer all the questions, and that will be your homework. Uh, due date for homework will be 16th of March, um, and uh, so that's an important information to keep in mind. Also, uh, please note that uh, those of you who attend all three webinars live and complete the homework assignment will be awarded a certificate of completion. And so that will be about two months after the completion of the webinar. Uh, it takes about that much time. So please wait, and if you haven't received your certificate, then you can contact Marina Smartens. Her email address is uh, given here. 
So this is session one outline, and that's for today. Um, first, we will briefly go over the Applied Remote Sensing training program. And then Kale will talk about overview of the WIC model. He will focus on features and processes uh, of WIC model, also a routing model uh, that has to be used along with WIC. So we will give information about that. So with that, I want to start uh, to talk about RCET program. Uh, RCET is Applied Remote Sensing Training Program that is a capacity building program that is supported by NASA's Applied Sciences Program. And as you can see, uh, our RCET's mission is to empower the global, global community through remote sensing training. Uh, the target audience is uh, environmental professionals and policymakers uh, in public and private sectors. And the idea is to uh, have societal benefit of uh, remote sensing observations in multiple thematic areas. As you can see, um, RCET does training in disasters, management, land management, health and air quality, and water resources management. So these are the basic themes where we do training. And some of you may already have taken our set training. Uh, so we have uh, training formats are different types. We have in-person training as well as online training, such as we're doing now. Uh, we have live sessions. There are some recorded sessions as well. Uh, depending on the type of training, um, it ranges from four to six hours of instructions for online trainings and from two to seven days in length for in-person trainings. Um, both online and in-person training, uh, they have introductory as well as advanced component. And depending on that, it is either presentations, demonstrations of case studies, or it can involve hands-on case studies where all the participants uh, work on their own computer to either access data or have uh, learned how to apply this data for a particular um, application. Uh, we also have uh, Train the Trainers uh, series, in which uh, RCET helps people or personnel who want to train uh, other people in their own organization or they want to work with other end users. Uh, RCET provides online training on best practices for uh, providing training. And uh, if there is other help needed, uh, RCET can be contacted for that. Again, as I mentioned, there are multiple levels of training. So fundamental level, uh, it assumes no remote or requires no remote sensing uh, background or no familiarity with satellite data also. Um, based on that introductory level, uh, it requires that you go through fundamental training some of these trainings, fundamental trainings, are already recorded and placed on our set website that you can access at any time. Um, basic or introductory levels, such as this one, um, is usually for introducing a topic or providing an overview or demonstrating some case studies. And then advanced level or level two, it requires um, some knowledge of remote sensing, um, also familiarity with satellite data. And then this is mostly in-depth, and it is focused on specific topics on also on a regional area sometimes. An example is uh, advanced webinar on remote sensing of drought that we presented last year, in which uh, participants actually worked with precipitation and vegetation indices data to detect um, drought in a number of areas. So this is RSAT's global uh, participation between 2009 and 16. As you can see, there are more than 100 trainings we have provided, and more than 13,000 participants have taken training from RSAT. Uh, we have reached 159 countries and all the US states, and uh, 3,700 plus unique organizations have participated in the trainings. So, um, this is RSET's website, and there is RSET listserv here that here all the trainings are listed. You can go to any of the online or in-person trainings, and you can join the listserv uh, so that um, sign up for the listserv to get um, information about upcoming trainings or uh, any other activities that RSET is conducting that you will be informed about that. Before Kel Market, 
provides overview of the WIC model. Uh, here is a brief outline of what uh, we're going to do. Next week, we are going to talk about all these different inputs, which goes, they go into WIC model. And then the output we get are water balance components, as shown here, soil moisture, evapotranspiration, transpiration, runoff and stream flow, and snow water equivalent. So these are the major water budget components that we get out of WIC. The WIC itself is a complex model. And so uh, the code is available to us. But to be able to run the model or use the model, it's good to know major features and processes that go into it. So that is what is going to be um, presented next. And then next week is about inputs. And the third week, then we will focus on outputs. So with that, um, I ask Kel to talk about the week model. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I hope everybody's day is going well. As Amita said, my name is Cal Markert. Um, I work with the NASA Severe Science Coordination Office. And my main role is coordinating all of the water activities that occur in, um, with the SEVERE program. So let's dive into an overview of the VIC model. So today we're going to talk about some different hydrology models and um, looking at why certain models over the other. Then we're going to dive into the VIC model, um, understand its features, understand its processes, and how do we get data and stream flow and all the processes that go within the VIC model. So we're going to dive into an overview of the VIC model. Uh, VIC stands for the Variable Infiltration Capacity Model. It is a grid-based model that simulates moisture and energy fluxes between the land and atmosphere. The VIC model was developed specifically to be coupled with global circulation models as a land surface scheme, and this model is considered a research model. Uh, the model was developed as an open source project, so that way everybody is able to access it, modify the source code and everything, so you can really tune it to your own purposes. So here's a brief overview of land surface models versus traditional hydrology models. Land surface models, so the purpose between, uh, the difference between the purpose of land surface models and traditional hydrology models is land surface models are really focused on simulating those uh, moisture and energy fluxes between the land and the atmosphere, where traditional hydrology models focus largely on the flood forecasting of water supply. In traditional hydrology models, the water balance is the most important um, piece that is simulated where in land surface models, it is both the energy and water that is important. And so how the model represents the land surface is, uh, in traditional models, they're mainly conceptual models. So think of the CN runoff curve method that is based on empirical relationships, where land surface schemes try to capture the physical processes that occur within the model. And in traditional uh, hydrology models, the vegetation, how that's represented, is implicitly simulated. So what I mean by that is the, it doesn't directly take in information on vegetation. Where land surface models, you have to represent that vegetation within the model scheme. And in traditional land surface models, when you run the model, they are either lumped parameters, so think of on a watershed-based or distributed parameters, where land surface models, again, they're coupled with these global uh, circulation models, so they're grid-based. And traditional hydrology models are meant to be run as offline simulations. So what I mean by that is you're running them um, on your own desktop, and then land surface schemes are meant to be coupled with those uh, general circulation models, so that way you have a two-way uh, movement of data between the general circulation model and that land surface model. But that's not to be said that they can't be used in offline, like we're going to show later on in this uh, webinar series. Okay, so there are a lot of hydrology models out there. And a lot of times the question is, why use this model over another? 
Well, really, you should be selecting a model that is focused for your application. And this, this selection is somewhat based on technical expertise. So if you're able to run a multiple different models, then you're able to select that model that best fits your needs. There's a lot of studies out there that have looked into different models, uh, their different parameterizations and calibrations, and how that um, and how that affects the representation of the data or the hydrology of a system. Uh, so when you're selecting a model, well, model selections really have a major effect on how the uh, hydrology is represented uh, and different components of the hydrology. And you should also understand the physical processes going on in the model to best represent those physical co conditions of what you're trying to model. Okay. So now let's dive deeper into VIC. So we gain that physical understanding of VIC. Um, so VIC was originally developed back in 1994 uh, by Liang et al. And so this was a uh, two-layer soil vegetation model that was physically based. And the whole idea is that it was coupled with these climate models. So we're able to simulate those water and energy fluxes at a grid uh, level. And here are the sources, so you can look up the original article. OK, so some main features of the VIC model. Uh, each grid cell is simulated independently. So what that means is the only water entering a cell is from the atmosphere or precipitation. The model can represent a subgrid vegetation or land cover variability, and also can represent subgrid elevation variability. And this is important, so that way we're actually um, we'll see later that the grid cells are fairly large, but being able to represent this subgrid variability allows us to better refine the model. Uh, the model is able to be run at a daily or sub-daily time steps. Uh, you're able to specify multiple soil layers, and it has a routing scheme that was developed specifically for this model uh, by Lohman et al., and we'll touch upon that a little later on today. Um, and a big component of this is groundwater is not considered within the model. So this is only uh, focusing on shallow soil water. All right, so as I mentioned, the VIC grid cell size is quite large. And there's a reason behind that. So the grid cells are simulated independently of each other. Again, only uh, water entering the cells from precipitation. So that means there's no channel flow, no subsurface flow, or no uh, recharge to soils from these rivers. And this assumes that the vertical fluxes, precipitation, are much larger than the horizontal fluxes, like channel flow. And so this assumption is usually satisfied with a large grid cell that is three kilometers to about two degree resolution or larger. And so some, some additional assumptions that go on within the model are groundwater flow is relatively uh, small um, compared to surface and near surface flow. Lakes and wetlands do not have significant channel flow. And that flooding over banks is in, in, insignificant. And so those are typically focused on that horizontal flux, right? You don't have the recharge into soils from rivers. You don't have uh, these large um, channel flows. And so, again, these are all usually satisfied if the grid cell is large enough. Here we're going to dive into the subgrid representation of vegetation. So the spatial distribution parameters of vegetation classes are specified with these input files, which Amita will go over in session two. Um, and so, this allows for the energy and water balance terms to be computed independently for each vegetation class. And each vegetation class will have different parameterizations, like leaf area index, rooting depth, surface roughness, et cetera. And so this means that with those large grid cells, about three kilometers or greater, we're able to specify what percentage of each grid cell is, for example, forest. And then we're able to scale the total water balance of each grid cell according to the simulated vegetation or what's going on within the vegetation or different land cover classes. So when representing these percent area of these different vegetation classes, 
uh, these classes must add up to 100%. If they do not, then Vic has a backup scheme for bare soils that's used for the remainder. For example, if we have 33% of a grid cell that's forest and 36 that's grassland, that adds up to only 69% of the grid being um, covered by a land cover, and then Vic uses that last 31% as bare soil. Okay. So here's a quick breakdown of how Vic represents uh, the subgrid elevation. So the subgrid elevation is really focused on capturing those orographic effects on precipitation and energy processes. And so this is very important to understand the differences between precipitation and snowfall and the snowpack processes. Um, and this, is, this really affects the representation of snow accumulation and snow melt timing between high and low elevations. Again, Vic has these pretty large grid cells, so you can have mountain peaks or what have you within these grid cells that actually accumulate snow, but may not be represented if you're using a global aerial average for that grid cell. So the user specifies these snow or elevation bands, and again, these are represented as fractional areas of each band of each grid cell. And so what happens is the mean pixel te temperature is taken at the mean elevation, and then Vic lapses, so calculates the temperature that it's supposed to have at each elevation band and uses that to calculate the water and energy fluxes. So when we represent these subgrid uh, variabilities, the aggregation, how these weights are actually calculated is pretty important. So these are weighted aerial averages, and so the elevation bands, the processes at each elevation band are computed first, and then the vegetation cover. So if you think of this as an iterative process, so band one, elevation band one, we're processing that, and then within there we process each vegetation class. And then we move on to band two, and then we process each vegetation class within band two, and so on. And then these are all summed up by weighted aerial averages um, by each variable, and then that's the final model output for each grid cell. And so again, these, the order of operations is pretty important. And so the more elevation bands and more vegetation types you have, this uh, significantly increases the computation time. So you don't want to add in, say, 100 elevation bands because that's um, a little bit overkill, and you can get the same similar results using, say, 10 elevation bands. So right now I want to pause real quick and ask a quick question. So with the VIC model, what is the smallest grid cell size that we can theoretically run the model at and have still representation of the physics, and why is that? Great, so now that we've covered the features of the VIC model, now we want to dive deeper into the physical representations of these hydrologic processes that the model captures. Um, before we dive into this, uh, the model does require detailed parameterizations, uh, and these parameterizations are pretty important for climate-sensitive regions. And what I mean by that is we need to finely tune the, the model parameters to actually capture what's going on uh, from the physical standpoint. And the VIC model does contain modules and options to capture those specific processes. So to start off with, we want to talk about the vegetation canopy. So the vegetation canopy representation is important to understand for the storage and how moisture is stored within the canopy. So what happens is precipitation falls, the canopy um, the leaf area index captures water, and whatever, does it, whatever the canopy does not capture is considered through fall, and that's um, precipitation that exceeds the canopy storage, and then that then, is that then goes into the land surface scheme. 
whatever the canopy captures in storage is either evaporated or transpirated. Okay. So when that precipitation falls through the canopy, then um, if it's snow, then we have a snow simulation module. Uh, so snow that um, captured within the vegetation canopy, again, is directly related to the leaf area index, but snow on the ground um, is captured through a two-layer energy balance model. So what I mean by that is that there is a thin surface layer that the snow falls upon, and then there's this pack layer, and then the energy is transported between those two. And so albedo and snowpack size evolves as the snow ages. And so when you have snow that occurs, then you know, dust or dirt gets on top of the snow, and then that actually changes how the snow holds in energy, the albedo of that. And so, and how snow is actually, the changing in albedo and how it's compressed and how that all changes, how the energy is flow, flows within the snow, and this requires calibration of these uh, snow parameters, such as surface roughness and albedo. Okay, and so as I mentioned before, there is um, we can distinguish between liquid or rain and solid snow precipitation. And Vic does this by using a simple linear method to determine the percentage of precipitation that is liquid or that is solid. And so we have an example here where we set a rain minimum being zero degrees Celsius, meaning that's the minimum um, temperature that rain can occur at. And then we have a snow maximum, which is the maximum temperature that snow can occur at. And then between those two values, um, percent snow or percent rain is then linearly interpolated between those. In this example, if we have a temperature that is 0.5 degrees Celsius, then that would produce 75% snow and 25% rain. So now that we've covered the snow processes and, and everything, now we're going to dive into this, uh, the evapotranspiration simulations. So the simulations that Vic uses for evapotranspiration is the physically based penman monteith approach, where we have surface roughness or radiation and all of that that is driving the evapotranspiration processes. When we're simulating ET, these are made up of three components. We have our wet canopy evapotranspiration, we have the dry canopy transpiration, and then we have a bare soil evapotranspiration. So what I mean by, between all those three is in the wet canopy we have straight evaporation, so water uh, turning into water vapor. In the dry canopy we have the canopy, the, the vegetation actually transpiring the water, so bringing the water up from the soil into the leaves and then transpiring it. And then within the bare soil, we just have straight evaporation that occurs by um, evaporating moisture within that uh, top soil layer. And so the bare soil calculations are very similar to the penman monteith approach, but they're, they include resistant terms and uh, that account for the soil atmosphere moisture transfer. So next we have our parameterization of soil. So this is a very important part within the model because this is where a lot of the, this, this governs how much water is infiltrated into the soil column, how much is surface flow, and um, the different base flow and uh, soil moisture, how, how those fluxes occur. Um, but in general, the soil information is poorly known. So what we do is we use a pedotransfer function, and this is taking information that we have and turning it into what we need. Uh, and so we have data on soil texture and information uh, from USDA soil classes, and we take that information and make assumptions and turn it into these physical units like bulk density, fuel capacity, and wilting point. And so, um, Soil texture, again, uh, the soil texture information is really important to uh, parameterize the soils within the VIC model, but again, it is 
based on assumptions and uh, may not necessarily be representat representative of uh, some of the physical processes. Okay. So when we parameterize the soil information, then we uh, distribute the soil column into different layers. So we can theoretically um, define an arbitrary uh, number of soil layers, but typically we have uh, two or three layers. So the model actually requires two soil layers, and this is for the water balance calculations. And then the, so, uh, the model, when you, we run it in energy balance mode, then it takes three soil layers. Again, there's no theoretical limit, but uh, two or three are typically used. And so um, within three layers, here are some example um, depths that are used within the NLDAS and the GLDAS models. Um, when we're calibrating our model for our specific case, then we have to adjust the lower two layers to make sure we're really capturing those. And, the, and we'll talk about this a little later, but the lower two layers actually define how much base flow occurs or what have you. Um, within the model, we also define rooting depths, and these are independent of the soil layer depths. Um, and again, these are user-defined, so these define how deep uh, different land cover classes penetrate into the soil column, how, uh, where uh, the water is being uh, taken up uh, for the transpiration calculations. Um, typically, rooting parameterization is taken from literature or estimated, and so there are quite a bit of studies done that look at the different rooting depths um, across the globe, and so we can take those and apply them to our model for our specific regions. So here we're going to discuss how the soil runoff and infiltration is parameterized. So this soil run surface runoff and soil infiltration is defined by the variable infiltration curve, hence the name of variable infiltration capacity model. Um, this variable infiltration curve was defined by Wood et al. in 1992. Um, and this is a nonlinear function that scales maximum infiltration and fractional saturated area. And this allows us to enable a runoff, subgrid runoff calculations. Um, so the curve is defined by a infiltration parameter, this B uh, sub infiltration. And this parameter is typically zero, is greater than zero, but no typically no greater than 0 0.4. And this defines the amount of infiltration capacity relative to the saturated grid cell area. And so once a saturated grid cell, um, or once the saturation of the grid cell um, increases above that infiltration curve, then that's considered surface runoff. And so by, by producing a greater value of that B infiltration, yields lower infiltration and more runoff. And so this is a parameter that's typically calibrated within the model. Okay. So subsurface flow, or base flow, is estimated using the Arno base flow model. Um, and so this is a function of soil moisture at the lowest layer. So these are defined by a couple parameters in the model um, where Base flow is linear at low soil moisture content, and so this reduces the responsiveness of, of base flow during dry conditions. And then the base flow is uh, transferred into a nonlinear relationship at high soil moisture contents, and so that produces rapid base flow during wet conditions. And so we can see here on the bottom right that we have a turning point uh, defined between this DSDM and WSW2 where once our soil moisture hits that point, then it turns into a nonlinear base flow. And here we're going to discuss how this base flow is actually formulated. So it's important to understand these base flow dynamics and parameterizations when we're calibrating the model. So that way when we run our calibration process, then we're understanding do these values actually make sense. So there's a link here that you can go to. That's a spreadsheet 
where we can estimate our uh, base flow for different model uh, parameterizations. So we assume one time step T1 to T2 at the low soil moisture layer, and our soil moisture is increasing from 300 to 310 millimeters. So this table uh, finds the change in base flow for that time step uh, at different parameterizations. And so here we can actually tweak our base flow parameters and see how that actually changes our base flow values for uh, the different days. And then these values like the W sub N um, super C, we define those based on other soil parameters taken from the pedo transfer functions. Okay, lastly, we're gonna talk about our stream flow routing. So stream flow routing is an important uh, concept. So we, um, the VIC model, land surface model, actually simulates our uh, surface runoff and our subsurface runoff, but we have to apply a routing model to turn that into actual stream flow. And so this is typically performed after the land surface model simulations. And we use the Lohman et al. model, which was designed specifically to be coupled with our land surface model. So what this model actually does is it applies a unit hydrograph approach at each grid cell. And so we create what's called an impulse response function, basically the time that water takes to reach an outlet for each grid cell, and apply that to um, the stream flow that we calculate, or the, su the surface flow that we calculate at each grid cell from the VIC model. And then this basically calculates the percent water contributed to an outlet from each grid cell at each time step. So then we take our surface runoff for all the grid cells and then turn it into stream flow at the outlet, as shown here on the right. So now that we've talked about all of the physical processes that go on within the model, I want to talk a little bit about some computational considerations. So when running the model, we have to be conscientious of how we actually implement the model. Um, so the model is compiled using free and open source C compilers. So the model is written in a C programming language. Um, it can be compiled using other compilers, but that needs to be tested. So currently we use the GNU C compilers. Um, so the simulations, because the simulations are run on a cell by cell uh, basis, it can be very efficiently parallelized. So we divide our basin into sub basins and then we can run that on parallel processors. Um, so the VIC model is built on a Unix or Linux operating system. So it's typically run within this environment and we'll see in our uh, model set up in session three that I use a Linux environment to set up the model. Um, and it is possible to run the model using Windows, uh, but this is not supported. And you have to have specialized software installed. Uh, typically the simulations are pretty efficient. They use about one uh, megabytes of RAM. So uh, because we're simulating on a grid cell by grid cell basis, um, so memory usage does not increase, but the time to simulate does. So we need to be uh, conscientious of how much, uh, how large of a basin we're simulating. Again, the number of snow elevation bands and the number of vegetation um, classes that we use within each grid cell. And so depending on the size of the basin too, we can use a considerable amount of storage for input and output data. Again, this depends on the basin size and time step. If you have a very large basin, then that's going to take up, you're gonna need a lot of data to run the simulations versus a smaller basin where you have uh, less data. Okay. So to wrap up, I wanna provide a couple resources that you guys can go to to learn more about the VIC model in, in further detail. Again, this, this presentation was largely focused on giving you a brief overview. And so if you wanna learn more, please visit these websites. Um, so the current VIC website, that's where a lot of the documentation is currently stored. Uh, and also on the routing model, they have a, another website. And we can all, there's also two links down at the bottom to actually get the source code. And this is the, the, the actual files that we need to use to run the model. 
And lastly, here are some references uh, for you to uh, look up uh, based on what I went over in the uh, presentation. Thank you. So, Kiel, the first question here is, can I use the WIC for reservoir management? I think the short answer is yes, but Kiel can... Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> you theoretically can. So I didn't touch upon this in this first session because, um, you know, again, the first session was focused on just giving you a brief overview. But you can specify, you know, further um, lakes and wetlands within the model. Uh, and this is a little bit more advanced topics within the model because it takes a whole lot more parameterization. And it was added in as somewhat of a, um, it, it was a follow-on development to the original model. But yes, you can use it for reservoir management and understand there's uh, plenty of papers out there that use um, VIC modeled streamflow as input parameters into the reservoir and then calculating reservoir change volume and everything like that. So the okay. second question is possible, yeah. Yeah, so I guess we'll just go through each, um, each question here. Um, yes. So the, the next question is, what are the areas of tropics where snow is not experienced? Is it possible to turn this off? Um, short answer is no, you cannot turn off the snow model. Um, so the snow, the snow model is actually really important uh, to calculate those energy and water balances, especially at high latitudes and mountainous regions. Um, but if you're modeling something in the tropics, say uh, the Mekong Basin then, or the lower Mekong Basin, then the temperature is too warm and theoretically no snow falls, so there's gonna be no snow accumulation within the model. Okay, and uh, here, question three, what is it meant, what is meant by lapsed temperature? So um, what I mean by uh, elapsed temperature is, hold on, let me make sure I pull this up and get the right answer here. Um, so it, we have we have a lapse rate uh, in atmospheric sciences. We have what's called a lapse rate, which is a relationship between altitude and temperature. And so basically what we're doing here, by what I say by lapse, is we, we use those um, elevation bands and say, here's our mean temperature for our grid cell. Here's our mean elevation for our uh, grid cell. Now, if we move our, if we move our elevation up, say, 100 meters, what's going to be that change in temperature from that mean elevation 100 uh, meters up? And so that's what we mean by lapsed temperature. Okay, here, uh, question four, is the model useful if there are groundwater springs and a river since it doesn't look at channel flow or groundwater below soil level two? Um, so it depends on the type of spring that you have. So um, if, you know, the spring is, you know, an ephemeral spring that is fed by base flow, then yes, the model will capture that. Um, if the spring is, say, an aquifer spring or what have you, um, then the model will not capture that because it does not consider that deep groundwater. Okay. So next question is question five. So what do, what do I mean by the climate sensitive areas? Um, and so this was in reference to um, talking about the parameterizations. So um, in climate sensitive uh, regions, um, we want to make sure that so, for example, in high latitudes, right, there's a lot of different processes that, that um, 
that occur that the model will need specific parameterizations to capture. And so um, when, you're, when you're simulating an area that, um, that's pretty sensitive to um, precipitation or temperature, for example, like the high latitudes are pretty sensitive to temperature, which the permafrost and snow accumulation um, are sensitive to, you know, few changes in uh, degrees temperature. Then we need a very detailed parameterization to actually capture those processes. So the question six is, can we take help from you regarding WIC? So um, as uh, Kale mentioned, WIC itself was developed, developed by University of uh, Washington, um, and uh, they have source codes, they have a forum, and they, you can also get help from them regarding the WIC model. What, the, what we are trying to do is that we take WIC as is, what Kale has shown us is what the processes are, and then next week we're going to talk about how to to get input data from uh, NASA remote sensing. So the main purpose is that you take the WIC from University of Washington, um, download the code, you install it on your computer, but it's not always easy to get input data uh, for WIC uh, for all the river basins or watersheds. So here is one mechanism that you can use uh, remote sensing or earth system models to uh, force WIC and then uh, you look at the output. So we can help with this in the sense that uh, you will have these presentations and recordings for reference, how to prepare and run a model. For WIC itself, um, it's the WIC site that is the model itself, you mean. Uh, I mean, you, you can contact University of Washington. Um, they have a, a help. Uh, Forum, I think. Uh, Kale, you can add to this. Yeah, they they have a help forum where you can sign up and you can send an email, and it will send an email out to everybody. Um, and there's a lot of uh, typically the University of Washington people answer very quickly. Um, uh, if not, someone else that's been using the model has um, will answer. So if you want help with the VIC model, definitely sign up for that um, that email list serve. Okay, question seven. Is the VIC model capable of running on a low power CPU such as single core? Um, I think, I'm pretty sure it is. So the, um, the VIC model is pretty, um, it's a pretty efficient model when you, look, when you actually look into the code. Um, and so the, I don't think it should run out of memory. Um, and it may just take more time. Another consideration to have too is the VIC model is pretty heavy on um, data storage. So you have to have some um, a lot of data storage space to run some of the models, depending on the size of your grid cell and basin. Okay, and question eight here is, do we need samples for soil sample. So um, I'm, I'm assuming you mean, do we need to go out into the field and collect uh, field samples for soil? Um, you can do that. Um, I think that will definitely help with parameterizing your model. Uh, what you, you can use, um, there's a lot of data sets out there that you can use to parameterize the model on the soil side, and they do a fairly good job. And so Amita next week will talk about some of the data that we have used to um, parameterize the soils in the model. 
Um, and but with with the caveat is you have to actually calibrate some of those parameters. So going out in the field will help you estimate those parameters uh, initially, but we can also calibrate those parameters as well. So uh, question nine is what are NLDAS and GLDAS? These are North American land data assimilation system and global land data assimilation system. Um, if you want more information um, on our set website, there is a uh, pre-recorded webinar. Uh, this is fundamental session 2B. It describes uh, NLDAS and GLDAS a little bit. And BIC is part of both these models. So that's why uh, they were mentioned. All right, um, question 10 here. Uh, this means VIC has limitations for base flow. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by limitations. Um, the model, as we saw, has somewhat of a simplistic representation for base flow. So base flow is a function of soil moisture at the lowest so, uh, the lowest soil layer. Um, but when you parameterize the model, you can specify the maximum amount of base flow that can occur within a day. So, and then, so what you do is you, you set that maximum base flow and the model will scale how much base flow occurs uh, per day based on that maximum base flow. So theoretically, there can be no limitations. You can say like it's 100 uh, millimeters per day or what have you. That's a lot. But again, when you, when you specify that much, if you have low soil moisture, then you're going to get low base flow values. And this, uh, the base flow, so parameterizing the soil depth and your base flow parameters like maximum amount of base flow and when that nonlinear base flow occurs is pretty important. Uh, one of the main parameters you calibrate uh, for the model. Okay, question 11 here. So about the soil column in slides 18 and 19, what if we have permafrost in the regions? So um, I didn't talk about this because this is getting into some of the more advanced uh, VIC model topics. Uh, Vic actually has a scheme to calculate frozen soils. Uh, typically, you don't have to play around with the parameters that much uh, to calculate this or to tune the frozen soil model. Um, again, this is part of that energy transfer, right? So the soil is going to hold energy or release energy, right? Depending on the moisture and all these other parameters, and so when you're in a permafrost region, um, it will actually calculate that there's going to be frozen soils and then that affects the um, like infiltration and uh, surface runoff and all of that because your, your moisture flow within that soil column is going to actually be hindered by that frozen part. Question 12, if I understand correctly, the VIC model combines both saturation excess runoff and infiltration excess runoff. Um, so I'm assuming what you mean there by saturation excess runoff is that your soils become saturated, you have ponding on the surface, and then what's left over is considered runoff. If that's the case, then yes. Um, that's that's how that's essentially how the um, variable infiltration curve works, um, and the infiltration excess runoff. I'm assuming you mean within the soil column, and if that's the case, then yes, we do have uh, infiltration. So if there's excess soil moisture within the column, then we have more 
um, base flow that's occurring. And so we so that base flow is also called subsurface runoff. Okay, question 13. I have Windows operating system. Can I practice this model using this operating system? Uh, yes, you can. Again, the, um, the model was built in a Linux system. So I would highly suggest if you are able to use a Linux operating system, then that you use that. Uh, but if you do have a Windows machine, you can compile and run the model using a program called SIGWIN. If you are to use SIGWIN, um, then you, if you use SIGWIN, then make sure when you install the program, you have the GCC compilers installed along with it. Okay, question 14. Um, how can we connect this model with regional climate model? Um, so there are, um, short answer, um, you have to couple the models, and I do not have experience with that. Um, there are examples, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but you can search it. The, um, the University of Washington had a, a project where they were coupling the VIC model with a WARF model and producing outputs um, for the Arctic region. And so that I would suggest if you want to use this, uh, the VIC model with these regional climate models, then you look into that as an example. So. Um because VIC is a grid-based model, um, it, it is somewhat easier to couple it with climate model. If you look at NLDAS and GLDAS, um, and there, is a web, there are websites for that, ldas.gsfc.nasa.gov, um, they, they show, like, climate model is used as forcing. Whatever comes from, out from regional climate model is used as forcing for a WIC model. So running WIC model with climate model output is relatively easier. If you want to truly couple it, so uh, energy and water fluxes going back to regional climate model requires a little more work. Uh, you have to take care of uh, certain physics. And um, so that's beyond the scope of this webinar. But this information is available from University of Washington. Also, if you look at NLDAS and GLDAS based um, publications, you can get this information. OK, question 15. Does VIC have routines to simulate tile drainage typically found in Midwestern US reservoir wetlands and agriculture activities? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what you mean by tile drainage. I'll have to look that up and and get back to you. Okay, so question 16 here. How do we use VIC models and couple them with GCM models? Um, I think we kind of touched upon that for, uh, I think it was question yeah, so just so. like in NLDAS and GLDAS, um, you, if you visit that website, um, you will have some more information. So it is really uh, any GCM would provide inputs for weeks such as precipitation, so weather data, um, also vegetation, soil moisture, all that uh, either can be specified or they can come from a climate GCM. The coupling part that you feed back uh, energy and water fluxes, soil moisture, evapotranspiration back to the climate model, that requires uh, a lot of work and skill both. So uh, best way to review that is to review NLDAS and GLDAS uh, literature, how they do it. So there's also a question, can you show some exercise with rough data? 
And that is what we're planning to do uh, in next two sessions. We will start with downloading data that go into WIC. And that is the next session. And the last session then, we will, uh, Kale will show uh, how these uh, data are put into WIC and how the model itself is run. So uh, we're going to use the Mekong Basin as an example for that. Um, also, uh, one clarification here is that um, what we are showing here is that if you want to use WIC for water uh, budget estimation or water resources management uh, or to monitor flood or drought, um, you can use it standalone without really having to couple it to any regional or global GCM or climate models. You can get forcing data from uh, NASA Earth Science uh, Earth System models and also remote sensing satellites. So that that is the major part of this session, that without coupling with any other GCM or climate model, how can you run WIC by itself, uh, getting forcing from uh, satellites and models? And that way, you can quickly look at uh, water budget components over your area of interest. And also, if there is, you can look at history um, over your region. And then looking at the fluxes coming out of WIC, you can see whether it's, um, whether it's flooding or drought conditions or there is excess of water or deficit of water. OK, so question 18 here. We have, um, is it possible to run the model with regional local data? Um, the answer is most definitely yes. Um, so you can, you can pre-process your data, your, like uh, precipitation data or, or what have you, land cover data, and use that as inputs into the model. Um, what we are showing you here is specifically how to um, use NASA data as inputs into the model, um, and in particular for data sparse regions. So, um, you know, part of the SEVERE program is we work in developing regions, and so we really focus on, um, you know, producing data where there is no data. Um, and so that's part of why we're using these NASA and showing these NASA satellite uh, data inputs into the VIC model. Uh, question 19 is recommendations for virtual machine software to run the VIC model on Windows 10 platform. Um, my personal favorite, because it's free and open source, is VirtualBox. And, um, they have some nice, um, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a fairly easy uh, interface, um, and they have some resources online on how to use it and everything. Um, so I would suggest that, but there's a whole, a whole lot out there. So the next question, do we have to download the WIC model prior to the next session? Um, Actually, uh, you don't have to. Uh, we are going to just demo. This is more of an introductory webinar. And from the question answer that we just received earlier, it looks like many people have not heard or used WIC before. Uh, some of you have heard but not used it. And some of you are using either SWOT or HECRAS or WIC or other models. So idea here is to. Um, just learn how to get um, input data put into WIC and analyze output. So it, it, the emphasis is more on getting input data, which may not be available any everywhere in the world. If you have in situ data or if you have a well calibrated uh, regional model that gives you forcing, that's good. But if you don't have uh, in situ data or you don't have, you are in data sparse region, then you can still run WIC with NASA data. So um, you can download model if you like just to try it, but we, our sessions will not 
involve running the model at this point. Um, if you are interested, if there is sufficient interest, we can definitely plan an advanced training later on um, and um, walk everyone through uh, WIC setup and WIC running. Okay, so question 21 here. Since Vic conducts an energy budget at the... Oops, I think I lost the questions. Okay, there we go. Um, since Vic conducts an energy budget at the surface, does it mean NASA provides a net radiation product? Um, so net radiation can be an output from the Vic model, but the... There's, I think, a couple different NASA net radiation products available from actual remote sensing data sets. Um, so I, it, that, 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 yes, NASA does have surface radiation budget data. And I'm trying to find the... Uh, I want to I say Langley provides that. I'm just going to try to... Um, website here that uh... okay so while Amita is finding that she'll she'll put in the um, the link to question 21 um, so that way you can find that uh, net radiation data product from NASA um, We'll move on to question 22, and is there Python integrated version of Vic available? Um, so yes, there is. Um, right now we are, so what we're going to be showing is the C version. So you have to compile the model and then run the model um, using that compiled executable. Um, there is a Python version where they have Python bindings to those C um, libraries, but I haven't used it, so I'm not. And from what I read online uh, from University of Washington, it's still in beta testing. Um, my best suggestion to use if you want to use Python, um, you can use Python to format the data sets and um, set up the model and then you can run the model using Python as a wrapper um, if that helps. Um, question 23 is how to decide soil column depth and parameterization. Um, so initially um, Initially, you kind of just guess, <laughs> really. Um, so, you, I mean, you look at your region and you say, here's what I believe is, you know, the best soil column depth um, uh, parameters. And then um, when you do your calibration process, um, your, uh, the soil depth, so the lowest layer um, of the soil column is definitely a parameter you want to calibrate within VIC because that's going to be, that's going to affect that base flow or subsurface runoff um, that the model calculates. And so you, um, you're going to need to calibrate that. So question 24 is how accurately uh, can this model work? And what are the maximum area of water bodies that can be applied accurately? So, um, I've seen the model uh, be extremely accurate, and that's for a um, very fine-tuned regional application. Um, right now, we have a NASA PI who's working on a project, and he's getting flood forecast values, or sorry, flood nowcast values of within the order of 30 centimeters from actual values. That's what I, I would consider that fairly good, um, especially for a macro scale model. Um, so, Kale, also um, there is model calibration involved in there, or 
Yes. Uh, so that is uh, an extremely calibrated model. And then I'll touch upon calibration in uh, session three. So um, I'll show you guys a, a quick calibration process. And so that way you guys can, can see how, like, kind of how that works and talk about which uh, values you calibrate. Um, and so it was, yeah, um, so it, it can be fairly accurate um, and depending on your application. Um, you want to, again, calibrate it. But if you just provide initial guesses, then it can perform pretty poorly. And also, too, I want to note that the model results are actually going to be pretty heavily dependent on model inputs. Yeah, Sorry, so question 20. Yeah, so go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, still on 24, um, the model results are going to be pretty uh, dependent on model inputs. So if you are using um, like highly accurate precipitation data, then your model's probably going to perform fairly well, as long as it's calibrated. If you have like poor precipitation inputs, then um, you may not get the best results. So question 25 is, please mention some applications of WIC model with examples. We're going to do that in session three. We are going to uh, show some of the um, applications where WIC is already used. In some case, it's used operationally to look at uh, flooding. So we'll definitely show that in the last session. Um, question 26 is about using WIC for water quality. Um, I think you can infer runoff, and if you have vegetation, but I don't think you can have water quality parameters in WIC. Right, Kale? Yeah, that, that's correct. So the models focus specifically on moisture and energy balance uh, components. And um, again, if you want to calculate water quality, you can infer for those from land use change and runoff. Um, but that's similar to how the SWAT model does it, but there's not really um, any methods for that right now within VIC. So uh, question 27 is, are there any limitations of the model um, if we work in an arid or semi-arid area like northern Africa, Egypt? Um, the question, or I would say no. I don't. I don't think there would be a limitation of the model, um, particularly because you can. The nice thing about the Vic model is you can really, really uh, parameterize it towards your region. Um, they, they give you, and you, we'll see in session three. They give you basically full reign of how you set up the model. And so you can set it for um, your regional studies. Um, and so I, I think I've seen some applications in semi-arid regions, and the model performed fairly well. But I don't know if I've seen any specific applications in North Africa or Egypt. OK, so uh, question 28 here is, is the VIC model useful for reconstruction of paleohydrology? Um, I would consider it yet. Yeah, I would say yes. Again, uh, it's really dependent on your input data. So if your uh, paleoclimatology data, um, if you have confidence in that, then definitely use that paleoclimatology uh, data as inputs into the VIC model. Um, since the VIC model is a physically based model, uh, the when you run the model, the physics aren't going to change depending on time. So it theoretically should be used. And there's a lot of studies that use the VIC model uh, for future climate. So uh, there's definitely been applications where it's been used for that. So I don't see any limitations why it shouldn't be used for paleohydrology. Okay, so question 29, since the VIC, it, VIC model is run on a cell-by-cell -cell basis, how can we effectively calibrate all those parameters at a grid cell? 
and can uh, we kindly elaborate on how the cal calibration was done in previous um, experiences. So um, there's, there's quite a few calibration strategies out there. Um, there's, there's a lot of literature out there on how to, like, different methods for calibrating. Um, the most common method is what's called a cascading basin approach. Um, and what that means is you have a outlet for a sub watershed and you calibrate. And so you, you basically go to the upper reaches of your basin and you calibrate for that, the upper sub watershed. And then you, and then you have your, and you have lumped parameters for that sub watershed. And then you apply that, um, you then move to the next sub-watershed and you calibrate for those parameters that only contribute to that sub-watershed, keeping that initial calibration parameters from the upper reach. And you just keep stepping down each sub-watershed and calibrating those, um, those grid cells that contribute to that uh, outlet. Uh, that is a very common approach that's used uh, widely, and um, so that way you're you're essentially uh, ridding the need to calibrate each grid cell, but you're uh, you're adding in more distributed um, information within the the larger basin. Um, so question thirty here is can the VIC model be run in monthly time step? Uh, answer is no. The lowest time resolution you have to run the VIC model at is daily. Um, what I've done for the model um, is run daily and then aggregate results to a monthly time step. Uh, question 31 is, can the VIC model be used to estimate water availability and appropriate these for multiple various uses within the watershed? Um, so the first part of your question is, yes, the VIC model can be used to, uh, to estimate water availability. So the big component of VIC is you're simulating the water budget at each grid cell. So you can understand soil moisture, snow water equivalent, uh, surface runoff, um, evapotranspiration. Um, so you're getting all those components of the water budget. But whether, so one limitation of VIC is that it assumes that it's a um, natural system. So when you have these reservoirs within your basin and everything, you have to, um, the VIC model doesn't, know that that's a human induced um, reservoir or how that uh, water is being used. Um, there are instances where there is um, where the where the model has been used to estimate irrigation and and everything and how that affects the um, the water balance. And so it it can be used for that, but at the baseline VIC model, like the VIC model that you get offline and everything, that is um, that is only for uh, natural systems. So what Kale is trying to say is that if you have a specific, um, you have a dam or a reservoir or in your region, you have to get this weak model and then have additional um, management component into it. And it is still a part of um, research that you do and then uh, make use of it. This one is just taking natural inputs, natural forcing. So uh, question 32, to which extent does VIC enable uh, parameterization for inferring underground water storage? Um, <clears throat> so I, excuse me, sorry. Um, so I want to 
make a make a clarification here. So there's two components to underground water storage. There's a shallow uh, water storage, which is like um, up to two meters. Um, so you have your soil moisture and root zone soil moisture. Um, so the VIC model actually estimates those, your soil moisture at, at each layer in the soil column, and then your total root zone soil moisture uh, that is available for plants. Uh, the deep water ground, um, reservoir is um, not considered within the model. And so the, um, so the VIC model cannot be used to estimate those, but there are methods out there to estimate groundwater recharge um, based off of uh, base flow and um, low soil or uh, the lowest layer soil moisture. But the VIC model does not consider that you would have to calculate, you would have to run the model, get the base flow data, and then estimate the groundwater recharge offline. Um, so question 33, uh, can the VIC model be used to determine water scarcity areas? Um, so I'm assuming so I guess there's two, comp I'm, I'm understanding this question two ways. So one is, can the model be used to determine water scarcity within an error? Uh, then yes, the model will be able to estimate whether or not, so again, it does a water budget. Um, it does a water balance model. And so it's calculating how much water is available in each component of the water balance. So you're, at, you're looking at basically your change in storage, your inputs, how that, how those different components are being used within a natural system. Um, so yeah, you can identify whether or not there's um, water available for certain processes. Um, now, if you want to use the model to determine water scarce areas, areas that do not have enough water, then I think, yeah, you can infer those areas from the model. Um, if you look at, um, say, like evaporative stress, um, you know, the amount of pre precipitation um, versus, the, um, versus the amount of potential evapotranspiration. Um, then you can use that. You can look. Uh, so that's, an, that's basically an uh, aridity index, right? How much, water do you how much water is being put into the system versus how much demand is there for that water. Uh, so you can use the model for that, but again, those are all kind of inferred and calculated after the simulations are done. Okay, last question, question 34. If I would like to run the VIC model image driver in specific watersheds in Peru forcing with WARF climate outputs, what can you recommend as best strategy to manage data inputs and calibration procedures in this complex geography. Um, okay, that's a, that's a tough, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so managing data inputs, so the VIC model, the image version of the VIC model, um, everything is handled via net CDF data sets. Um, so I would, um, if you're worried about data storage or what have you, then, um, then NetCDF has a compression level that you can set. Um, and from what I remember is you have your soil parameters, your vegetation parameters and different NetCDF uh, files. And then you have your precipitation or your forcing as a separate NetCDF file. Uh, so I think the data management actually becomes very manageable um, using the image driver. But the calibration procedures, um, I would suggest that you, um, especially because Peru is, it has a lot of terrain. Um, it's a very, it's very dependent on the snow, uh, snow runoff for water that you should really look at um, not only calibrating the model, but also 
um, bias correcting your inputs if needed. Um, so you're using WARF data on, or your WARF outputs. I'm not, um, you know, depending on how well your your model is simulating the temperature and, pre and precipitation, um, that's going to really affect you know how much snow is actually accumulating in those areas. Um, and so that's going to be a big component of the water balance within Peru. And so I would I would check whether or not the uh, wharf model is producing um, correct results. If not, perform some bias corrections, and then and then calibrate the VIC model parameters based on that. Um, I won't touch upon this a little later, but because VIC is um, typically you calibrate uh, soil parameters, but you can also calibrate snow parameters within VIC, such as uh, when uh, when precipitation is considered liquid versus solid, um, and also your albedo for new snow versus old snow and, and, and snow uh, roughness like surface roughness. And so those parameters are also going to affect your, um, how the VIC model calculates these changes within snow. And so I would highly suggest looking into um, calibrating those snow parameters along with the soil parameters, uh, especially in Peru. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you so much for attending this session. And thank you, Kale, for um, such great explanation of uh, big processes and features and answering all the questions. So um, we will see you next week at the same time. Uh, we will be talking about how to prepare input for a week model. Uh, so um, thank you again for attending this session. and. Um, a uh, recording of this session will be available soon on our website. Thank you, everyone.